All right, I am back after some uh, little bit of a break. Um, very detailed study that I did here. Going to be on the Testament versus Covenant. This is one of the questions, I forget which one of you asked it, but um, in the question, answers to your question thing I did a little while ago, you said, what is the difference between Testament and Covenant? And a lot of the new versions, new Bible versions will remove, they'll replace Testament with the word Covenant, New Covenant rather than New Testament. Um, what's the deal there? Well, I'd heard a little bit about some of this stuff, but I never really did the study myself. So I was very tempted just to say, well, let me just go get my uh, Bible study charts and outlines by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, where you hear this book, and I was going to just go grab it, and, and this will give me my answers, be, the difference between the covenants and the testaments. Right here is his whole section on covenants right there two big charts on covenants and i was just going to go do that but i thought you know i've seen this thing numerous times and um what i believe my responsibility is as a bible teacher slash preacher is i need to be able to do the study myself and thereby confirm what peter ruckman has said um, another witness in other words uh, paul wrote to timothy 2 Timothy chapter 2, he said, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Get a lot of snow right now, so if you're hearing plow trucks there in the background, that's what's going on. They're right out here. But anyways, and I thought to myself, um, just copying what people have said and, and just, well, brother so-and-so or this person or that person has written this and whatever, I thought, you know, I don't think that's what the Lord wants me to do on this study. I need to actually go through every single reference to both the words Testament and Covenant. 272 references to Covenant, if I remember correctly, and uh, not quite as many to Testament. But uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, the word Testament is a New Testament word. Uh, it's not really in the Old Testament there. But um, So I did the study, and uh, the Lord really showed me some interesting things. And, of course, most of what I'm going to be saying will line up with Peter Ruckman or, you know, other preachers out there and things. And uh, But I just I think it's a dangerous thing to always just rely 100% on the writings of other men that are saved. As great as that is, I think at its time, there's times you just need to do your own study, your own research. And I'll tell you what, I think that the best way to study the Word of God, hands down, is the word study method. Um, just go through all right, I want to study, I know uh, Brother Philip Newton, uh, he's you know, right back and forth with him, and he's been a friend of the ministry for a long time, and he's been doing a study on the word rock. Um, and that's the way you study it. And, and you'll find some things. You'll go into it with a preconceived notion. I think it's going to prove this, and you'll come back going, but wait, that verse there, I never saw that verse before, and that kind of throws off my theory. And uh, you know, It's an interesting thing. Uh, study the word church throughout the Bible. Study the word tribulation. That's another good one. Uh, there's a lot of good um, word studies that you can do, and that will give you an idea of the doctrine on that particular subject. The word repent or repentance or repented, you know, or repenteth. There's a lot of different variations of the word repent. Do a word study. You don't have to say, well, I wonder what verses talk about it. Well, the ones that have the word in it, you know, so, um, but pretty interesting stuff. But uh, another thing I just want to say real quick is thank you to everybody that was praying for my back pain. It's pretty much gone. Um, I had, I think I probably messed up something upper back, you know, a while back and a while ago, I'll say it that way. And um, and it's just a, a matter of it. It just kind of flares up. And I know that there's different exercises. Uh, one sister in Christ sent me a thing of these guys doing they're physical therapists and they can do different back exercises and you kind of twist and you rotate your head a certain way and you can you can lay on a roll type of a thing and uh, you know kind of a tube I'm saying like a, a roll or whatever you can lay on that and kind of make your back kind of crack your back and things and that usually takes care of it uh, so uh, it, it is definitely gone um, again uh, did, not going to get into all the stuff that I did and everything else, but a big part of that is your prayers. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing. I, I have another study I'm going to be doing in the future 
uh, but and I wanted to work on the notes for it, but the Lord deals me with, with me on stuff like this, and it just says, you know, one study at a time, just get your notes done, and then go on to the next one. And uh, so I'm going to be preaching this one before getting study started on the study notes for the other one, but the idea is um, about the dual nature of the flesh. I preached a sermon on this thing many, many, many years ago. Uh, I don't even, it's not in any of my audio sermons I uploaded. It was a long time ago uh, that I preached the thing of the dual nature of the flesh. And it gets into the thing of how you have to take care of your flesh. And yet when you take care of your flesh, your flesh is strong. And it's stronger and, you know, trying to tempt you to sin. But if you don't take care of your flesh, then you're weak and you're stronger in faith, you know. But then it's <laughs> it's it's a really weird thing. Um, and so I'm going to be getting into some of that in the future. But I have that study to do, the dual nature of the flesh. I'm going to be doing a um, thing, another one of your questions out there was the thing of, uh, I think Sister Tammy, I think, asked it, uh, the thing of uh, the book of John, uh, the Gospel of John. Is it comparable to church age doctrine? How does it fit in? Because you have Matthew is written to the Jews about receiving their king, and then Mark and Luke, there's some different stuff there. But then what about John? Kind of written towards, you know, saved Christians. So we're going to get into that. Uh, there's a couple other ideas I have. Um, kind of some pressing stuff and I, I am trying to go through the ESV right now and I'm putting together some stuff on that um, just to kind of keep the heat on the Vatican versions out there because the ESV is the new the darling of the new version people so need to kick that thing but uh, there's some other things I could say too announcement wise but we're going to get into the study now don't want to go off on a big thing here so we're going to start out first with the word testament. Let's look at those references. And we're not going to go over all the words to co or you know all the references to covenant because there's just a lot of them and a lot of it is repeating the the bigger one is the Abrahamic covenant. Um, we'll get into that. Matthew chapter 26. This is going to be, you know, a very detailed study. Um, not definitive. Um, I mean, like I said, we're not going to go over everything, every single verse, but we are going to definitely hit some uh, a lot of scriptures in this study and um, should be an interesting study for you it was for me to write it you know so Matthew chapter 26 verse 26 through 28 says here and as they were eating Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the new Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All right. This New Testament comes in then with what? The shedding of blood as the payment for sins. That's what it, when it comes in. It's not the same thing as a covenant. So we're going to see. Covenants can be confirmed with blood or without blood. Sometimes they are unconditional. Sometimes they are conditional. Again, I'm going to be proving that in this study. Go next to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. We're going to see a lot of the same thing repeated here in the different accounts. Mark chapter 14, verse 22 through 24. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Blood of the New Testament. We're going to see the tie-in as we continue. Luke chapter 22. Why is it important for the blood thing there? What's the blood all about? Luke chapter 22, verse 19 through 20. Okay, it says here, And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. We'll get back to that in just a minute. Verse 20, Likewise also the cup after supper, uh, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. All right. Uh, that thing that he did there was purely symbolic. There was no saving grace or whatever else, like the Catholics try to teach this thing of the the bread and the wine, the body, you know, the, the flesh and the, the blood. 
that thing didn't do anything. All it was doing is just a thing to remember. All right, and, and of course we have that in the New Testament here in the Pauline epistles. We'll look at that passage next. But that doesn't take sins away. You know, and it's been very well said. A uh, good thing that you can say to a Catholic is, they say, when was the, you say to them, when was the first Mass? The first time that the Eucharist was instituted and whatever else. And they say, well, the, the Last Supper. You know, they have all their paintings, the Last Supper, Jesus at the Last Supper, and he's sitting there in the middle going like this, and all the disciples are, you know, sitting around, you know, all this stuff. Um, and they'll say, that was the first Mass. That's the Eucharist. Uh, did that take away their sins? Oh, well, yeah, you know, the Mass, you know, kind of gives a, a momentary grace of your sins are momentarily taken and things. Okay, then why did Jesus die on the cross? Number one, if that took away their sins, why would he go and have to die a painful death? Couldn't he just keep doing the Mass and teach them how to do the Mass and just say, there you go, you know, just keep doing the Mass and that'll pay for your sins, you know, just as long as it's perpetual. Be kind of a dumb thing to do of Jesus if the Mass takes away sin. Why go and die on the cross? Just keep telling people, turn this here, you know, uh, Peter, you're the first pope, so come along here and, and here's the bread, here's the wine, you know, take it. Well, it's not round, Peter, make sure it's a round wafer, you know, see it looks like the sun. And then you take it and you slowly elevate it, you know, and over here this is, you know, hey, um, you know, Philip, could you go down and get some, uh, you know, uh, some blacksmith or something to make a monstrance for us? We need that, you know, it's important. <laughs> It's Catholicism, but you know, use these arguments on them when you get into a, into discussions with Catholics. You know, where's the stuff at? And if if that thing was there, and if that helps take away sin or gives you a short term grace thing until you it digests in your system, then you got you got to go get it again. Why didn't Jesus just say, well, you know, Peter, just keep doing the mass until you die, and then you give it to the next guy, and then till he dies and you just kind of pass it down through the apostolic succession, just keep on doing it. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? You know, now that's problem number one. Number two is uh, the bread and the wine, according to Catholic doctrine, becomes the actual flesh and blood of Jesus. Uh, well, Jesus is sitting there in his flesh and blood, physical flesh, physical blood. Why break bread and have wine Drink wine. Why not just, you know, chop a piece of his arm off or something and pass it around? Say, take a bite. You get the, the flesh and the blood all in one, you know, sitting. <laughs> See? It's a weird thing. And it plainly, Jesus plainly says there, Luke chapter 22, verse 19, this do in remembrance of me. It's a time to examine yourself, in other words. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 23, if you're remembering what Jesus Christ did on the cross, it's going to give you a different attitude towards your sin. <clears throat> when you think about how Jesus died, how he suffered, how he bled, and think that your sins put him there on the cross, and my sins, you're not going to be too quick to continue in those sins and just have a flippant, eh, no big deal. I can do this stuff. My conscience doesn't convict me or whatever. No. That's why the purpose of communion is there, that you ex you examine yourself. You say, okay, Lord, is there anything in my life that I'm doing that I need to get out of my life? You know, you judge yourself. The Bible talks about here. Judge yourself. And think about, remember what Jesus, the great sacrifice that you know, that he did on the cross to pay for your sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and went, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So how long should you do it? Well, till he comes back. You should constantly be examining yourself. Let's continue. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You're eating and drinking unworthily in the sense of you're not judging yourself, you're not examining yourself, and you're just messing around in some kind of a sin, and that's a bad thing. Um, when you actually think about what Jesus Christ went through and you actually sit there and, and imagine that thing in your mind and think, if that was you that went through that, you're taken, you're given a false criminal trial and you know they beat you in the process of that whole thing to within an inch of your life and then they take you out and they, they put you on this you know wooden cross thing and they you know hammer nails through your hands and through your feet and you know you die a slow, torturous death. That's a terrible thing. And to think of Jesus going through that for us, for our sins, you might want to kind of stop the sins that you're messing around with. It's a good thing to do. But look at verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. If you mess around on your sin, I mean, the Bible says, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Well, that's for lost people. It's for anybody. When you mess around in sin, you're earning wages there. You're sowing to the flesh. You will to the flesh reap corruption. You don't want to mess around with sin. You know, I, I just, I get so irritated at these false converts and they get so upset when I say about you got to turn from sin and you got to, you have to change life after you get saved and things. Well, I don't have to. Why would you fight it? Why would you fight the Lord and say, I don't want to give up these sins? Why? Sin is negative. I mean, name one sin that is not negative. I don't know of any. All sins are negative. They're self-destructive. Because if you don't judge them, you mess around, uh, you, you know, sear your conscience, essentially, uh, you're going to have some problems in the future. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Isn't it nice that the Lord actually allows you to judge yourself? Every time you step out of line, every time you mess up, the Lord just doesn't go, boom, and just nail you. He's not up there just, just with a big old whip just waiting. To, oh, wham, hits you. Oh, you did it again. Wham. You know, huh? -uh. The Lord is merciful, and the Holy Spirit of God will be in your life and and. You do something really bad and whatever, and, and you know, and even even minor sins and whatever, anything, any kind of a sin, and the Lord will come along and say, "Why'd you do that? Why would you do that?" Um, uh, do you think you ought to quit that? Yeah, you can quit it. Judge yourself. Holy Spirit will convict you. You judge yourself and you say, you know what, I need to get that thing out of my home. I got to get that thing out of here. Remember what Jesus did for you. I don't want him to have to suffer more. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God whereby I am sealed until the day of redemption. Verse 32, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. All right? And you can go on and read the rest of the you know, passage there, but the whole point is if you don't judge yourself, God is going to have to judge you. He's going to have to punish you. He's going to have to chasten you. All right? But you're not going to be condemned with the world. You're not going to lose your salvation. It's an important thing to remember. Turn next to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. I've actually heard New Version people or modern professing Christians, and they'll say, See, the Bible is the letter, and the letter killeth it killeth. It's the Spirit that will give you life. You need to be open to this leading of the Spirit. <laughs> and I go, what? <laughs> you know, huh? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, 
You go back into Psalms and it talks about the words of, of, of God are sweeter than honey. They're, they're a delight to the soul, you know. Wherewithal shall a young man, man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. But the, the scriptures kill you? No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the Old Testament law. All right, that's what it's talking about. The letter killeth. You try to live by the law, you're going you're gonna to perish in that and you're going to die and go to hell. You can't live by the law. You know, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It convinces you that you're, that you're dead, essentially. Uh, you're in, you know, big trouble. John chapter 6, verse 63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So there you see the thing of this, but the spirit giveth life in verse 6 there. It's referring to the word of God. Holy Spirit inspired scriptures. This book will bring new life to you. It'll correct you when you're wrong. This is the book of life right here. I mean, you know, a, a lot of my preaching, a lot of times I have to talk about some of these false movements and whatever else because you're going to run into it and you're going to say, how do I answer these people? Well, listen to these sermons and you're going to get the answers to because I deal with these people myself and, you know, I've learned how to answer them over the years and I'll pass that knowledge on to you. <coughs> but look at down at uh, verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Amen. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. We'll be talking more about that towards the end of this study. Um, I'll just kind of spoil a little bit for you here. There are two covenants in terms of Moses. There's the old covenant, the old Mosaic covenant, but there's a coming, a new covenant, which is very interesting. And I'm going to have to do another study on this subject because I was talking with my wife and I was going over some of the sermon notes and what the Lord's been showing me for this study. And we got to talking about it and the Lord was really showing us some things, uh, some really, really interesting things for the future. The time of Jacob's trouble going into the millennial kingdom. Um, some things... Uh, Anxious to, to share it with you and you know my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I want to get your feedback on it. Uh, so, Rob, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Bad tendency to do that. Turn next to Hebrews chapter seven. Hebrews chapter seven, verse twenty-two. It's kind of funny too because you get a lot of these non-dispensational wing nuts, and they say. They'll say, salvation's always been the same. It's always been the same. Uh, well, then what would be the point of the Old Testament being abolished? They're saved by faith alone the whole way through the Bible. Well, then what's the point of there being a New Testament? You know, it's weird. It's weird. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. It says here, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. No, no, we don't need a better testament because they had the, you know, the gospels, you know, by grace through faith the whole way through. Why do they need a better testament? <laughs> Weird. Look at these people. I mean, you know, I, I, the the falling away that the Bible talks about in Second Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, I'm convinced that. Um, well, I shouldn't say convinced, but I wonder sometimes if, literally every aspect of truth somebody out there has to come out with the reverse you know just total error in the other direction stuff that's so easy to refute you just say huh you know uh i mean i've i've talked with some of these people followers of stephen anderson some of these baptists and things and they'll say salvation has always been by faith and i say you mean to tell me that they were saved by the gospel death burial and resurrection of jesus christ first corinthians chapter 15 1 through 4 they were saved that way in the old testament i've had them say yes 
I said, so they put their faith in Jesus before Jesus showed up on the earth. Yes. <laughs> I mean, and they're serious. It's kind of nutty. But that's the world in which we live, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 9. Now here's where you get into the, the real, what is the New Testament all about. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8 through 22. There's a bunch of verses we got to go over here. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Okay, um, non-dispensational people, what do you do with that? While as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation, or the time of new order, if you have a new version. <laughs> and you can look that up. I mean, like I think, uh, I think the NIV might say new order. Some of them, they say new order. Crazy. Verse 11 here. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Sorry, Catholics. Um, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Again, how do you do this if you're non-dispensational? You say, well, it's the Old Testament salvation is the same as it is today. Then why are they sacrificing animals? It doesn't make any sense. And there's so many other arguments you get into. It's just crazy. But here, verse 15 through 17 are key verses in the, in the, here in the New Testament to prove when the New Testament came in. If you want to stump somebody, a non-dispensationalist that's really arguing with you, take them here. All right, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. Say, ask him a simple question. When did the New Testament come in? Almost across the board, they will say, Matthew chapter 1. And you can say, no, sorry. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. I knew a brother years ago, um, used to be in ministry with him, Jesse Dolesky, and he got to talking to an older man that was a Baptist, going to a Baptist church we used to go to. A real nice guy. Definitely a saved man. And, uh, you know, Brother Jesse said to him, he said, uh, you know, when did the New Testament come in? And he said, well, Matthew chapter 1. And Jesse said, uh, open your Bible, Don. Look up uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. And he said, read that to me. And Don was a very educated man. He was a school teacher and everything else. And he read it. And he said he got done reading it. And he looked at Jesse and he said, I never saw those verses before. He said, I've been over those verses, but I've, I never saw it that way. Wow, you know, yeah. Let's read them. Verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of, the necess of, also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. When did the New Testament come in? It wasn't Matthew chapter 1. That's why they're going and they're you know, doing sacrifices and going to the temple and whatever else. It came with the death of the testator, Jesus Christ, his death, his blood that he shed. Let's continue. Verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and, goat, and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission." Again, another thing that you can use, people say, John MacArthur and his followers, they'll say, well, it wasn't really the blood, it was the death of Jesus. 
That's not what Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says. There is no remission without the shedding of blood. And there's so many other scriptures, again, that you can prove that thing. But the New Testament comes in with the death of the testator when he sheds his blood. That's why he calls it, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All right. What is the last reference to the word testament? Turn to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Okay. It says here, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So, there's the ark of the testament in heaven. And uh, I'm not going to say much more on that thing, but... Um, Next we have covenant, all right? Where's the first covenant made? Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. Genesis chapter 6, verse 18 is the first time the word covenant shows up. It says here, But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So, who is the first covenant made with? Noah. Right? That's where covenant shows up. Now, um, in Dr. Ruckman's charts over here, he has seven covenants. He likes to arrange things into sevens and things, which is fine. I mean, seven is the number of completion. It's God's number, the seven spirits of God. The Bible talks about in the book of Isaiah, referred to in the book of Revelation. Talked about that before. The judgments, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, it's seven years, and there are three sets of sevens. In that time period, there's a lot of seven, a very interesting thing there. And, of course, you know, it's not numerology. Numerology is an occult perversion of God's system of numbers. All right? But Ruckman tries to make seven covenants. Well, you can make the argument for there's two others that would precede the, the covenant, the Noahic covenant, if you want to say it that way, the one that God made with Noah that we're reading about right here. And that would be the Garden of Eden and then with Adam after the fall. Uh, you could say that God made a covenant. Now, the reason I didn't include those is because it doesn't actually specifically come out and say covenant in the passage there. Um, I went through all the different references. If I missed where that is referred to as a covenant, uh, let me know. But as far as I know, uh, from looking at the thing, I don't see any scriptures where that is called a covenant, the Edenic covenant and then the Adamic covenant. I don't see those. Now, you can make the argument that that was some, there was kind of an agreement there, you know, that, that the Lord um, certainly told Adam and Eve, you know, that, you can stay here and you're not going to die and whatever else until you eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, unless you eat it, I should say. Then after that, then the Adamic covenant would be, you know, that uh, that they're going to die and, and whatever because of sin and things. You know, it, and, and I just thought, I'm not going to include that stuff in. So um, I can see why he argues for that, but I'm going to stick with the other five covenants, which he also teaches. And I didn't get it from... His, you know, looking it up, I went through all the scriptures myself. And I recommend you do the same thing. Just spend some time with the Lord. It's going to take a while. It took me a couple days to do this study, um, which I don't, I can't spend all my time doing that because I have a lot of you to answer. I have other things I need to do online, um, research and, and, you know, whatever. But, uh, so it does take a little bit of time to go through and do all the big word study and whatever and go through all the scriptures, but you'll come out better in the end. The Lord will show you some interesting things when you do that, when you take time. The old hymn says, Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him only and feed on his word. Um, and it goes on. So you can look up that one. Take time to be holy, I think is the name of the hymn. But let's continue. Genesis chapter 9, verse 8. Genesis chapter 9, verse 8, we're going to see more about this covenant that God made with Noah. 
And there are, like I said earlier, there are different types of covenants. There are some that are ever, everlasting and unconditional. There are some that are conditional and therefore not everlasting. But let's see here. Genesis chapter 9, verse 8 through 17. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth, with you, from all that go out of the ark, to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations." It's an everlasting covenant, in other words. This is one he's not going to break. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant, see it, everlasting covenant, between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So what is the first covenant? The first one that is mentioned, I'll say it that way. The first one that's mentioned, the Noahic covenant, is God is not going to ever again, he made a solemn promise that he is never going to, going to destroy all flesh on the earth by a flood. All right? It's going to be by fire at the end of the time of Jacob's... Well, at the end of the millennial kingdom, excuse me, um, <clears throat> when the first earth and, and everything is burned up. But well, that's another issue. But the whole point is, this is the first covenant that is mentioned in Scripture, the Noahic covenant. And this covenant, what is the token? A rainbow, bow in the clouds there what the Lord's talking about here. And, you know, got to talking about this with a brother, and, and he was saying about that the perverts out there, the sodomites, the LGBT, whatever other letters they have now, uh, they, they actually have their gay pride uh, flag is actually six collars, whereas God's rainbow, the real rainbow, is seven collars. Hmm. And a very easy acronym to remember the name's of the or the uh, yeah the names of the collars of the rainbow God's rainbow is Roy G Biv R O Y G B I V say so what is that red orange yellow green blue indigo violet all right so it's seven I think I did the thing with my hand a little bit wrong there but you know it is seven collars the seven collars of the rainbow. And it's interesting because the sodomites usually will take out indigo. They usually remove that. And I actually saw there was some sodomite pride parade um, down South, South America somewhere, and they actually had an eight-collared flag. They put in indigo, but then they also put pink in with the thing. <laughs> so I thought, didn't do the six thing, but you went to eight. So uh, there's a reason why they're turned over to a reprobate mind. You know, things go a little bit loose up here. But uh, let's continue. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, verse 17 through 18. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. All right, and then it goes down through there, uh, talking about um, the different, you know, pagan peoples that are in that land, and that they're going to drive them out, essentially. But the whole thing is, what was the Abrahamic covenant? Well, what we're reading here, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. All right, so it's a huge tract of land, physical real estate that God promises to Abraham and to his descendants. All right. Um, and it's a thing where he, you know, it's a, it's an everlasting covenant. We're going to, I'm going to show you that as we continue. 
Go to chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Yeah, we're going to read the whole chapter here because there's a lot of stuff about the covenant. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multitude, multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant, look at that, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto to thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So two times there you see everlasting covenant, verse 7, everlasting possession. You know, it's, it just cracks me up, all this stuff over there in Israel right now. Uh, you know, the Jews need to get out of this land. It's not their land. And you, you see some of the Jews don't care. They're just whatever, worldly. But then you see others, they're saying, this is our land. We're not leaving. You know, this was given to us by God. They're the ones that are right. And you better not ever go against that. It's a dangerous thing to mess around with God's everlasting covenant. We'll be talking more about that as we continue. Verse 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Interesting, because in the Noahic covenant, God gives the token of the rainbow. Here, God is saying, now it's up to you to circumcise all males, children of Israel, all of them. That's the token of you to me. Hmm. Verse 12, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your, house, in your generations, he that is born in the house, or, brought, or bought with money, or any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So circumcision is a, is a token there of that covenant. You're showing that thing. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abram, then Abraham, I'm used to saying Abram, <laughs> Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day, as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, his son. And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Okay? So, there's a lot of different things there that we could go over, but you know the point I'm trying to make with reading this whole thing is it's very clear that this 
covenant that God is making with Abraham and Isaac, not Ishmael, Abraham, Isaac, and those descendants that go down through, the Jews, in other words, uh, that it's everlasting. Now, if it gets to a point where God says, okay, no, sorry, I changed my mind, then God's a liar. Isn't it interesting that all the people that believe in replacement theology, all the Catholics and a lot of other people now too, all these replacement theology people literally believe that God lied to Abraham. He said it was everlasting, but later on he had to change his mind and he kind of went with the church instead. You know, we'll see, it's, it's everlasting, but it's just in the sense of it changed from, uh, you know, the Jews to now it's the church. We're now, we're now Abraham's seed, so technically it's still there. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's talking about physical seed. We're going to see this as we continue. Genesis chapter 21 Verse 27 through 32. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs, uh, just see where I'm reading to. Um, for these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, and they, that they may be a witness unto me, that I have digged this well. Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because that here, there they swear both of them. Thus they made a covenant at, at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up, and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. So Abraham and this um, Abimelech made a covenant. So, covenants can be made between people as well. So, you'll see that. As you go through the Old Testament, you'll see a lot of the, you know, some of the places where men are making covenants between themselves. We're going to talk about another one here in just a little bit. Exodus chapter 2. Go to Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. Okay, it says here, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Hmm. They got themselves into trouble. You know, went down there, and they stayed around Egypt and things, you know. A lot more I could say on that, uh, Egypt being a type of the world and everything, but uh, they got to messing around, and God didn't say, well, you know, sorry, hey, you're sinning, sorry, covenant, nope, disannulled, no, God's not going to do that. Exodus chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Just plain as day. Exodus chapter 23. Go there next. I mean, you know, if replacement theology is true, would it really be worth Serving God? Serving a God that can break His Word? No. Exodus chapter 23, verse 32 and 33. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it, is, it will surely be a snare unto thee. So again, here's a warning. Don't make covenant. Don't make these agreements and things basically with you and the heathen world out there. Don't make a covenant with them. Still very true for a Christian today. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, we're told. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 24, verse 7 through 8. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said... 
All that the Lord hath said will we do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. All right. Now here's an interesting thing. In the Old Testament, one of the covenants there is the covenant that God gives to the nation of Israel. He brings them out of Egypt, and then he gives them laws to live by, what we would call the Mosaic Covenant, the laws of Moses. It was a covenant that God made where he's saying, okay, I gave this Abrahamic covenant whereby you're going to be blessed as a people and you're going to inherit the land, but I'm also going to give you this, this covenant through Moses saying, if you follow these rules that are good for you, if you follow these different things, these different standards that I have, things are going to go good for you. And the law, the, the Ten Commandments are part of that. So in a sense, you could call the Old Testament, um, I mean, technically, you can't really call it Old Testament is the same as Old Covenant because there are different covenants within the Old Testament books. So, you know, stick with Bible wording there. But we're going to see about this covenant, this Mosaic covenant as we continue. Exodus 31 Exodus 31, verse 16 through 17. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It's supposed to be a perpetual covenant there. It's a sign that God gave to the nation of Israel. Getting ahead of myself. Verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. All right. So the covenant there, the, that Mosaic covenant, is there as a sign between God and the Jewish people saying, Okay, I've promised this stuff to you through Abraham, that you, you're the physical seed, you're going to get land and you're going to multiply. That's there. It's an everlasting covenant. But now your part in this thing, uh, me doing this for you, now your part is... Here are the laws, here are the rules that you're supposed to live by, and you'll have a good life. And as long as you're doing those things, this is supposed to be a perpetual thing, but it's not God that's forcing them to do it. It's up to them. They have free will, whether they're going to keep the Sabbath, whether they're going to keep these laws that God gave to Moses. And you should do this as a perpetual thing. God's not forced into this system. It's not an everlasting covenant from him to man. It's him saying, I'm going to prosper you as long as you're doing right, as long as you're doing what I've given to Moses. All right? And we're going to see that as we continue. Exodus chapter 34, verse 27 through 28. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. So there you see, he's actually saying, I made a covenant with thee, Moses. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Hmm. The words of the covenant are the Ten Commandments. That's pretty interesting. And notice that Moses was there in the wilderness forty days and forty nights. And it says there, he did neither eat bread nor drink water. He was fasting in the wilderness. Interesting because when Jesus Christ comes down, he fasts in the wilderness for 40 days. Hmm. We'll see more about that as we continue. Leviticus 26. Verse 14. Now here we're going to see what happens when they start to mess around with, uh, you know, messing with the Mosaic Covenant. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 14. But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant. What's the covenant that they're breaking? The Abrahamic covenant. They're done. God's going to use the church now. No, it's talking about the Mosaic Covenant. Verse 16, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror. 
You think the Jews live in terror right now and over there in Israel? Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, well, they broke the commands. They broke the Mosaic Covenant. Um, I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning egg, or egg you. I'm not sure how you say that exactly. That shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Punish you seven times more for your sins. Hmm. Almost like the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. Seven years, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. Hmm. I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Very interesting. Verse 19. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if ye walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues huh, upon you according to your sins. Verse 22, I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if ye will not be reformed by me by these things, but will, not, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. How many times have we read this now? Three sets of seven. Do you realize that? Here in verse 24, Verse 21 and uh, verse 18. Hmm. Verse 25, And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered under the hand, in, into the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall break shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. There's the fourth one. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation, and I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste." Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Um, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. And upon them that are left alive of you I will send a faintness into their hearts uh, in the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf uh, shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursueth. And they shall fall one upon another, as if it were before a sword when none pursueth, and ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies. Let me just stop there for a minute. Interesting, because Jesus says in the New Testament there, he says about how that uh, except those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. You know, and you look at stuff that goes on in Israel. They are wicked. Extremely wicked. And if you ever have a dealing with a with a Jew, uh, there's some very very, you know, arrogant people. Extremely arrogant. You know, praise the Lord when one gets saved. That's one of my favorite things to hear when a Jew gets saved. But I'll tell you what, I've had some dealings with Jews over the years. They are very cocky. They are very arrogant. I remember I, even as a boy, we were in New York the one time, um, and uh, not even in New York City, but an area where there was Jews. And uh, forget the area. I mean, I was pretty little. And I remember these Jews, Orthodox Jews and things. They just, they don't even look at you. They won't even look you in the face. And if you're in the way, they'll just, you know, 
shove you out of the way and get what they need at the grocery store and whatever. Um, very arrogant people and uh, very, very prideful and there's a lot of very, very wicked things going on over in Israel. Uh, they broke the covenant that God gave to Moses and they're going to pay for it in the time of Jacob's trouble with lots of uh, seven judgments, in other words. Verse 38, And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquity of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass which they have trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I have also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, will I remember, and I'll remember the land. So what's that covenant with all three men? The Abrahamic covenant. How do you know? I will remember the land. The land that God gave to Abraham for his descendants. You know, Jewish descendants through Isaac and then through Jacob. Verse 43, The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lieth desolate without them and they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity because even uh, because even because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. All right. Very, very, very important passage of Scripture here. Extremely important. And you understand then, again, oh, are Christians going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, the Great Tribulation? Absolutely not. It's not about us. It's about those Jews. It's about the nation of Israel. God is fulfilling His purposes with Scripture. He gave them the Mosaic Covenant. And they disobeyed it. They broke that covenant. And so God is going to make some things happen there. Don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's continue. Deuteronomy 7, chapter 7. See, the Mosaic Covenant is conditional. The Abrahamic Covenant is not conditional. 